and I got hit by a car in the Bronx, a hit and run. I started feeling this feeling of like, I know I'm supposed to do something really special and I have no fucking clue how I'm going to do it. And I started just praying, even though I didn't know what the words meant. I felt really alone and I was like, I feel like the only thing that can, can like soothe me is somehow for some reason or whatever, I called it God. It's like God will be the thing. And that will, that's what will give me like the success. That's what will give me like, like somehow God is going to do this for me and I'm going to like make a deal with him. It's like old school, like basic shit. Like I'm going to like not smoke weed and I'm going to be like really disciplined and I'm going to, I'm going to like serve him. Prayer for me was always like a thing that felt real to me because I'm more of a heart person than a head person probably. So for me, it was always like, okay, you caught like calling out to God at that time. Like, how am I going to become Modest Yahoo? You know, I didn't know it was Modest Yahoo, but like, how am I going to become this thing that I want to be, you know? And then like pray to God for it. So I always kind of had this little bit rebellious sort of side to myself, kind of like that I'm going to do my thing. I have this like dream, you know? of being free, of shaving my beard, of getting divorced. The religion is just like, I feel stuck in it. I don't, I don't feel like I really am moving in it. I don't feel like the same inspiration that I did. It was like, I woke up that morning and I was like, this is my face. I own this face, no one else does. If I wanna shave, I can fucking shave. And I did, I went into I cried, I bawled my eyes out. This like Puerto Rican chick at Supercuts is like shaving me. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, yep, I can do it. <laughs> it's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's gonna break down, it's a breakdown. She's gonna break it down. And now a word from our sponsor, Betterment. Let's talk about you and your money. You like your free time. You like to relax every now and then. You like to feel totally chill. But your money? Your money likes to work. And Betterment is the automated investing and savings app that makes your money hustle. While you're catching up on sleep, your money's up early, earning 11 times the national average in a high-yield cash account. Your money's a multitasker, diversified and expert-built portfolios of low-cost ETFs. And your money's optimized with automated tax-efficient strategies, just like the pros use. Your money is a total workhorse, so you don't have to be. Because you've got Betterment, the automated investing and savings app that makes your money hustle. Visit Betterment.com to get started. Learn more about high-yield cash accounts at Betterment.com. Investing involves risk, performance not guaranteed, cash reserves offered through Betterment LLC and Betterment Securities. Betterment is not a bank. Hi, I'm Mayim Bialik. And I'm Jonathan Cohen. And welcome to our breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. How about we break down (laughs) addiction, spirituality, who can make reggae music, and is God in the fire? <laughs> Just another Tuesday. For nearly two decades, this guest has kept his creative spirit aflame by evolving his sound, melding genres, and testing the limits of the musical traditions that inspired him. We are speaking with Matis Yahu, whose recording career began in 2004. His breakout track, King Without a Crown, blasted into the Billboard charts in 2005. He also wrote One Day, which you may know. Um, Jerusalem, you may know. Um, He had significant dreadlocks, which he actually cut off and burned in a fire before he became a recording artist and religious Jew. He has since left Orthodox Judaism, but still is putting out unbelievable music. His latest release is Hold the Fire. The single Fireproof takes inspiration from a dream he had um, with strong, strong connections to uh, to Judaism. But he is a Grammy nominated Billboard number one ranked gold certified musician. You do talk a lot about the um, Jewish content of some of his songs. And I think it's, you know, for me, you could remove the Judaism and this spiritual uplift, no matter what you believe in, no matter what faith or background you come from, is still so powerful. There's something that moves through this man in his music that is uh, transformational, transfixing. It's really otherworldly to hear this man sing. 
I don't think I've ever heard him talk as in-depth as he does about his teenage years, what his rebellion looked like, why he dropped out of high school to follow Fish, being in rehab twice, wilderness camp changing his life, and then discovering music, and then discovering traditional Judaism. And how he got discovered in music. He had this raw talent in the era of hip-hop being in New York City and sort of how he got discovered and exploded onto the music scene. It's really, he's such an amazing storyteller. He's a great storyteller, and um, he really talks us all the way through his journey in and out of observance, in and out of faith. And he talks a lot about uh, what his role is now with his older son living in Israel and how he sort of has chosen to use his platform to keep putting out music that is really, really spiritually um uplifting. I mean, that's, that is the word and really, really dialed in to so much of the human experience. It's really um, so excited to welcome to The Breakdown, Matis Yahoo. Break it down. Hey, Matis, how you doing? Long time. Been a while. I mean, Matis, you were my top Spotify listen of 2023. I have the, I have the evidence to support this. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. We've wanted to have you on for quite some time, and we're really, really, um, really excited to get to talk to you. So I hope you will indulge us and do a little bit of a stroll down um, memory road, as it were. Um, we we obviously, we love your music. We love all the things that you stand for. We love sort of the journey that you've been on. But I do think it's important for us to hear a little bit about your journey, because I think it also um, helps kind of underscore you know, where you have arrived musically. So um, you were raised in White Plains, correct? Correct. And you you were not raised religious. You were raised, was your family Reconstructionist? What was your kind of religious participation? Yeah, Reconstructionist. Can you explain what that is for people who don't know? Sure. So my parents are both New York Jews. And it, actually, we lived on, well, I was born in Pennsylvania on a farm, not on the farm, in the hospital. but um. My parents found out that the the owners were anti semites. There was like a boy that used to come have breakfast with them, the farmer's son, every morning. And on the news one day, sure enough, is something about Israel or something. And the kid says, "My parents said they should have all died in the Holocaust." Oh! My parents literally got in a car with me. I, think I was like three months old and drove to Berkeley, California. <laughs> That's the other place where people do think that we should have all died in the Holocaust, but that's a different story. That's the ironic thing not, you know, at this point. But at that point, it was like 10 years after the sixth, you know, it was like, you know, they wanted to live there during the, during the, the hate, you know, and right. that during, so it was like 79, it was a little bit later. And uh, they drove across country and we lived there till I was four and then moved back to, to, to White Plains, New York, where I, which is where I grew up. Yeah. So Jewishly Reconstructionist Judaism um, kind of rejects the notion of chosenness, but still embraces a lot of the ritual, right? It's still got a lot of like feel good stuff. And yep, um, it's very much uh, like equal, like men and women being called up to the Torah. Both men and women are wearing yarmulkes and um, talises, and if they want to wear to fill in, you know, um, sort of like the religious thing is kind of like everyone has a different level. You know, I would say the majority are more towards the reform level, but some are actually coming from Orthodox families and just kind of like found Reconstructionist Judaism as a way to be able to believe what they believe, you know, and common sense kind of things, basically. But um, yeah, so basically um, it became important to them when I was like about maybe six years old. And so that Hebrew school had three times a week. So four to six, Monday and Wednesday and Sunday, 10 to 12. So it's kind of a lot if you're not (laughs) religious. And it sucked for me. It was like, it was really hard for me. I was in a class that was all girls and they were all from Scarsdale. Um, My father like ran a homeless housing agency and my mom was a social worker in school. So it was just like a whole, just, it was just weird. And I think I had have learning disabilities, uh, as your team just found out, you know, <laughs> um, but like, basically it was very difficult for me and I, I did not enjoy it at all. Um, but it did teach me like the language, the Hebrew, I learned how to read Hebrew and I did, um, I did hang out there even past my bar mitzvah. So when I was like 16, someone came to talk about program in Israel and I went, I went for three to four months or something like that. 
during the school year in Hold Hasharon in a conservative program. And that kind of was definitely a game-changing experience for me in my life. Yeah, there was once some study that came out. I think it came out probably when I was in college. I did a minor in Hebrew and Jewish studies. And so we talked about a lot of these sorts of things. There was some study that came out that actually said that going to Hebrew school like a couple times a week could be more damaging to a kid's Jewish identity than not going at all. Because it was like you're getting these like bits and pieces and it's like not really integrated into your life, but like they're trying to integrate it. Um, I'm a little bit older than you. I mean, I'm a handful of years older than you. And like all the boys dropped out after bar mitzvah. I was raised in a reform synagogue and all the boys dropped out and it was like a bunch of girls. But I like I went all the way. I, I was confirmed. I wanted to be a rabbi. Like I love chanting. But also this was like you know, in the 80s and early 90s where it was like, women, rabbis, what? You're crazy. <laughs> where did you grow, Where did you grow up again? I forgot. I grew up here. My parents are from the Bronx and they lived um, in the village and they moved to the West Coast when my mom was like nine months pregnant. So I was raised in like the Melrose Fairfax area. So I was raised in one of the more Jewish parts of Los Angeles that you can be raised in um, outside of sort of wealthy communities. I was not raised in a wealthy community. Um, and my mama Lushen was Yiddish. Like that's the language that my mother spoke to me in. My mother's my mother's parents were immigrants from Eastern Europe. And on my father's side, my grandmother also immigrated from Eastern Europe. Um, they were, you know, leaving the pogroms before the Holocaust. So I grew up, my mom was raised Orthodox, like Eastern European Orthodox, like superstitious, like not really believing in Western medicine. My grandparents never really spoke English. So I grew up with like very much Eastern Europe kind of hovering and the Holocaust sort of like just outside of, you know, your plane of understanding. Um, but yeah, I was raised in L.A. I, I say I was raised in L.A. like it was the 1940s in the Bronx. Very old fashioned kind of upbringing. And my parents, I don't think, had a strong belief in God, but they wanted me to have some Jewish, you know, structure. And so um, I went to this reform synagogue, but, you know, I was kind of like the one who always wanted to do more. And, you know, I went to um, Hebrew school. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last few years, I've been drinking AG1 every day, no exceptions. One scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, makes me feel more energized, focused, and nourished. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre- and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. With AG1, I'm giving my body high-quality nutrition and getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support. Each batch of AG1 goes through a rigorous testing process, so you know that it's safe. Their ingredients are sourced for absorption, potency, and nutrient density. I'm covering my nutritional bases right from the start of the day. I like to drink AG1 first thing in the morning. That's how I know I'm starting the day right. If I'm running short on time and can't mix my AG1 before heading out, I just grab a travel pack. Each is an individual serving of AG1 that's easy to mix on the go, which helps ensure that you get your daily nutrients no matter what. If there's one product we had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. That's why we've partnered with them for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash breakdown. That's drinkag1.com slash breakdown. Check it out. Mind Beyond's Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. I don't know about you, but there's a lot I could do with even just an extra hour in my day. I'd spend more quality time with my kids or even take a few extra minutes to myself to meditate. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time, but the question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and to make that a priority. And turns out therapy can help you really hone in on what matters to you so that you can do more of it. My experience with therapy is that I've made a time investment to spend some time in therapy, figuring out how to better spend my time when I'm not in therapy. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash break today. To get 10% off your first month, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. Mind Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Third Love. Do you want a bra that's sexy or a bra that's comfortable? Well, thanks to Third Love, you can have both. Third Love was started to take all the frustration, ick, and ugh 
out of bra shopping. That's why they make solutions for every bra problem, aka problems. Their bras make it easy to bring back the support you've been missing, get smoothing you know where, and have straps that actually stay put. They do. Designed at their headquarters in San Francisco and made from premium materials, they put every style through hours of wear testing on real women, including themselves, before it's given the stamp of boob approval. Comfort and support are guaranteed. Plus, whether you're a double A cup or an H cup, their virtual fitting room will help you find your perfect fit fast. They even invented half cups. No more feeling stuck between two cup sizes that don't fit. That was me until Third Love. At Third Love, bras can be sexy and comfortable. In fact, comfort and support are guaranteed. Plus, you can visit their virtual fitting room to find your perfect fit fast. It's time to get your problems solved. Use code PODCAST15 for $15 off your first order at thirdlove.com. You had a a rebellion paired with the Grateful Dead and Fish, correct? In your high school years? I was sort of like the last hippie. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I hung out with some of the older kids that were like the leftover hippies. There was like a couple. and um, But there had been like a glorious group of years at White Plains High School sometime in the early 90s where there was like a bunch of, you know, deadheads and people that left home a couple of people and were living in their cars in Cape Cod. And you heard like the legend of Jason Lichty or, you know, there was a kid named Ronald with these huge dreadlocks and he was like 13 and he like left, he left home early too. Um, so there was sort of like this thing, but if you wanted to hang out with hippie kids, you had to kind of go around. There was uh, the wetlands and uh, I think it was Tuesday night was like free in Manhattan and it was like Grateful Dead cover night and there was drum circle downstairs and young hippies from Jersey and Connecticut and New York would flock to this place. And that was, you know, everyone would talk about what their plans were or whatever, if they were going on dead tour or fish tour or, or rainbow or what, what the plan was. Did you, um, did you follow fish? Like, were you a fish follower? I did. I dropped out of high school and I went on fish tour. <laughs> Did you ever see the dead? Because we're the same age, and I was supposed to go see Jerry in, in Toronto in, I, I forget if it was 93 or 94, but he died that summer right before, yeah. and I didn't get to see him. But my brother, who was three years older, had, you know, his friends got the last of those runs. Yeah, I got to go to a couple shows at MSG. Um, there was a girl, Maggie. That was kind of, she was like Winnie Cooper from the Wonder Years. Like she was kind of nerdy and really skinny. And then um, she came back one summer and she was beautiful, but no one was like willing to move past, you know, what they knew. And I was always really nice to her. And then her dad was a fucking deadhead. And she, my karma came back to me and they, they invited me to MSG to, to <laughs> see the dead. And I got to see Gary Garcia when I was like 14. Or maybe I was younger. I might have been 12. Because I remember, I was say you, yeah. twelve or thirteen, probably. I think twelve or thirteen. I was in middle school because I remember like people smoking weed, even offering it to me, and not really knowing what what it was. And a year later, for sure, I knew what what it was, you know. Um, but yeah, so that, and then my parents were deadheads. So when we lived in Berkeley, when I was a bait, like one, two, and three years old, I was at the Oakland New Year's shows, like nineteen eighty, eighty one, and eighty two. So I never got to see Jerry, but my brother had a collection of tapes and I would go into his room and start stealing, steal slash borrow his tapes and began to have a huge collection. And we had a bunch of our friends who were um, tape collectors and we would trade and, you know, would take three cassettes and then have to record them and then give them back. Um, so we could do a deep dive on the years of Grateful Dead that you like the most, which mine was going to roll our eyes at. I mean, I don't know why we're talking about anything besides everybody's favorite Grateful Dead songs. I mean, I'm I, I'm not a Donna fan, so that that like knocks out those that takes years. out those a years nice little chunk. Um, but yeah, I do I do like '80s. I like I do like early '80s Grateful Dead for sure. I will, I'll take a 74, 72 over an 80, but I, I understand where sure. you're coming from. And for like sure. a 78? Yeah, yeah, I, no, I, I get it. I also, the for sure, 72, 74, but like something about that time frame that's just the corniness of like the keyboard sounds. I just, I kind of love it. I don't know why. Jonathan, are you done? Do you need more Grateful Dead time? 
I mean, we could go probably for a lot longer. We've barely scratched the surface. But given that this is not a Grateful Dead podcast, I will wrap this section by saying that uh, a lot of my friends, uh, I didn't drop out of high school, although I wanted to. Mostly I didn't drop out of high school, I think, to follow my friends on tour uh, because of the driving. My brother was in a really bad accident. And so I was really like nervous about all the, you know, after the show, people were just like on the road and that sort of freaked me out. As, as you should be. I, I, the driver, I was coming home from a fish concert once and the driver in the Volkswagen that I was driving and just literally fell, fell asleep. asleep. And I was like yeah. tripping. It was horrible. And he drove off the side of the road and like took my head out of like a ditch. Like still on acid. <laughs> well, that kind of leads into my next question, actually. I was, I was going to ask, and I'm not asking in sort of like a sensationalistic way, but I am curious about sort of, you've talked about your experience with hallucinogens and with sort of, you know, I, I mean, I, I would see it as sort of your first dip into a transcendental, you know, space. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about what that opening was for you as a teenager. Um, you know, we don't, on this podcast, we don't like tell people to do drugs or not to do drugs. But I do think that especially because access to a spiritual notion is such a big part of your music that I I would be curious to know if any of those experiences felt like a touch of spirituality or if it just felt like fun or if it was linked more to music. It's always been this combination for me between mainly spirituality and music um, and some kind of personal struggle that I'm going through, which always kind of like comes up in front of my face. And so early on as a kid taking psychedelics at like 16, is a little scary because you don't really know how to deal with those things a lot of times. Um, and uh, that can put you into a, a bad place that's like hard to recover from. Uh, it's really powerful psychedelics. It's not like having a beer or smoking a joint or taking even an edible. It's like, it's you're really messing with your brain. <laughs> and um, so, and at the same time, it is, it is incredible. Like uh, that first trip, I was 16. I was at in Worcester, Mass at the Centrum, seeing fish for the first time with a good friend that I had just met in Israel <coughs> and um, kind of like had some freedom. We had a car and we were going to see fish and we took, dropped acid together. And, um, you know, the, the, the memory like that I mainly have from that show, it's kind of a little bit blurred, but it's like, this feeling during the music that this was like literally all I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I didn't know what it was, like how I was going to do it or what, like what, it, what that looked like. All I knew was like, I felt a deep calling that there's something about this music that's just so powerful. And the feeling of the, of everyone being unified, like colors meshing, sound, people and everyone together, this kind of like, real spiritual feeling i guess it would be like the first time one of, well not the first time but like the f- one of the first few times that i felt like spiritual feeling of god you know? a lot of other times like early on the spiritual feelings that i had were linked to like a sadness or like this a feeling of like loneliness like i went to one, that same year um that summer I went to into Colorado and I did like a sweat lodge on like a trip and was like out in the woods hiking around. And I remember then this feeling like of, of what I was referring to as God, but it was like this feeling of loneliness, like for the first time, like really deep feeling of being alone, like in the world. And, um, and that, so that was like my first like spiritual feeling. Was the notion, was the notion that God was the antidote to that? I get. I don't think so. I think it was like the feeling, the, like the haunting feeling of something like that isn't really that isn't there. You know, it's like I, I don't. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't really know, but the fish feeling is was quite the opposite. You know, it was filled with all the sensory and all this intensity and sound and people and and that was a you know it's a very different feeling than being sitting on a mountain top and. Colorado after, you know, dipping, you know, in freezing cold creek water after getting out of a sweat lodge. And then you're just like, you know, very awake, but very different kind of feeling. The sadness I can relate to as a sense of spirituality, because in some ways, it's just the most intense emotion. And so if 
for me, when if I was not used to feeling any sort of emotion, all of a sudden the intensity of something like sadness can feel spiritual because it's just uh, the op, you know, not the opposite, but an extreme. Yeah, absolutely. And it's sort of something that you're feeling something outside of yourself, maybe like you're feeling this other, or you're feeling that you know you're part of of something, and sometimes that feeling part of something can be like an incredible feeling. And sometimes it's like, make can make you feel very small, I guess, you know, or very alone. You know? It's a foreign concept, at least to a lot of Jewish thinking that, you know, there's sort of like God is good and everything else is bad. And, you know, for me, the, the sort of the Jewish mystical concept is sort of that God just is, which means that's going to hold everything that feels good and also everything that feels bad, but that it's kind of one and the same. So there's there's not really a distinction. So the depths of loneliness and the depths and the heights of ecstasy, you know, are are in theory held by the same, you know, universe. They're held by the same God. So also as it relates to fish, even if it's not on psychedelics, there is an experience there that unifies in a way that is quite particular to that experience, especially at MSG. I don't know if you were at MSG for their New Year's show, the three shows in 1999. That was the first time I'd seen them at MSG. And the building actually shakes when when the everyone, you know, I don't know how many people MSG holds for concerts, but there's, you know, 10, 15,000 people. And all of a sudden, in the right groove, the entire uh, stadium everyone is bouncing at the same and you can feel the floor underneath you moving all of a sudden you're like, holy, we are a part of something. It's like you're standing at Sinai. That's what I'm feeling. You're standing at Sinai. Kind of for, for, for our generation, <laughs> for, for a small group of people, cult followers of fish. That's definitely what it feels like. It felt like. Here's a little tidbit from your bio that I'd like you to clarify for us. It says you went to a wilderness camp. Wilderness therapeutic program. You know, the type that kids get woken up in the middle of the night, put in handcuffs. Have you heard of those these stories? Um, for my, in my situation, my parents were like, would you like to go on another outward bound? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Fuck yeah. So I was sort of like, went very willingly and then got there and they were like, give us your clothes and no talking. <laughs> How old were you? I was 16. Was this, was it because of the drugs? Well, yeah, I went, I dropped out of high school. I went on fish tour. I moved to Burlington and I kind of like hitchhiked and I went to rainbow gatherings, went on fish tour, came back, went to rehab at a place called Arms Acres in Westchester. Wait, wait, hold on a second. We, we, you went, you, you wanted to go to rehab? You were done having fun? <laughs> Again, I was kind of tricked. My grandmother had like $3,000 that was supposed to be given to me. Um, and my parents were like, if you go to rehab, we'll give you that money from your grandmother. And wow. then I was by my own car and was already, had already sent away for my like mail order tickets for fish for spring tour. So I was like, just part of the plan, I'll go. Um, uh, so yeah, it was like, I think it was three weeks. It was Thanksgiving cause my, my family came for Thanksgiving. That was a fun a fun thing. So did you feel like you needed to be rehabilitated from something or like, I mean, did you feel like, Oh, I have a problem. I mean, did it feel like BS? I was pretty fucked up when I got home. I mean, I literally got mono on tour and then had it treated like it was bronchitis. Someone gave me antibiotics and then had like, just, I was just really a mess, like physically uh, and mentally. So I, at some point called my father cause I was in the hospital and just to ask for the insurance stuff. And, and it's, and my mom was like, you should come home. And I was, I, I came home. I just got on a ticket. I got on a flight. I had lost my shoes at the concert before. So I had no shoes. I got on the plane with no shoes and a drum. <laughs> and the how is that not the title of an album? The only flight that like my mom could get because she was like, you're going from here to there, you know, your your whatever your caravan or whatever can drop you off at this airport and there's a flight, right? So the only flight she could get was a first class ticket. I had never flown first class before, but and you had no so, shoes and a drum, yeah, six foot four with dreadlocks <laughs> and like a fourteen inch Remo, <laughs> like massive djembe, no shoes. 
scabies, <laughs> quaddies. Do you know what quaddies are? They're like it's like another level of lice where the the like they no. grow. Yeah, and they're like literally flying around no. in your um, mono, <laughs> and like was having a hard time putting words together. And yeah, like, <laughs> so yeah, I came home and I was kind of like pretty fried and pretty shook. And, um, and, uh, I remember like the car ride home, like tr- trying to convince my dad, like what an incredible experience it had been. <laughs> and my dad just be like, just be like, this motherfucker is so far gone. Um, but yeah, I went to rehab and then I tried to go back to high school for like a month. And then I went out on this wilderness trip and then I ended up at a place in Bend, Oregon for kind of like you know, 18 to 22 year old young people who yep. kind of trying to figure out how to do stuff, how to function. And you were not, you, d- uh, rehab didn't take, like you didn't, you didn't feel like you wanted to be sober, correct? No, I think I was, I was pretty sober during oh, okay. the fall. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I was uh, like on the, from the wilderness trip and the year that I lived in Oregon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what was the wilderness thing like? It was bad? No, it was awesome. It was incredible. Huh. Um, it's like, it was like no talking, like literally, like you're not allowed to talk for like, I was on, I was, I was on a trip that was supposed to be three weeks long. And um, basically you just hike all day, like in a line through the desert. And then when you get to camp, you all like each individual person sets up their own camp and is responsible for like, you, you have like a tarp, you don't have a tent, but you set up your tarp. You have like flint and steel, and so you make a fire, and then you have like a very limited amount of food that you have to ration, you know, like every week. So you have like a stick, a block of cheese, and like a one thing of salami. I remember that those were like the golden things. Everything else was like lentils or like granola, and um, and basically you would you would set up your camp, and in the morning you would break everything down proper way, hike, and you would do group therapy. Um, you know, like maybe I think once a day it was group therapy. What do you remember of that? Like, did you like talking about your feelings? Yeah, I was great. My parents is like, my parents are like either they're social workers, they're all their friends are social workers or therapists. I've been in therapy since I was like a kid. Um, You know, so for me, it was like, I know how to do this shit. I've been to rehab twice. I, I was like already like, you know, and and I had also had these kind of crazy experiences on fish tour and stuff. So I could like tell everyone what their problem was and do, you know, and I knew exactly all the stuff to say. And uh, so they they kept me for like another trip and had me miss my sister's bar, bat mitzvah. And that they they wanted to shake me up a little bit. And that definitely did it. And it was a moment I remember doing tshuva like in a field, just like, what the fuck? Just feeling like, oh, you know, bad about myself and stuff. So I don't know about all that, but all that part. But the part that I think was awesome is I remember the first day I got there, they were like explaining how to use the flint and steel and how to set up the tarp and all that stuff. I'm like, fuck, I don't need to listen to this shit. First of all, somehow I kept my clothes. Like everyone else had to wear these (laughs) uniforms and I kept like my fish fucking clothes. I like wouldn't let them take my clothes. So like, I'm like, I'm going to go like meditate, right? These fucking idiots. And I go like walk up the hill and I'm like, you know, trying to meditate and feeling stupid because I don't know how to meditate and like trying to think I'm, you know, in touch with God, but I just don't even know what the fuck that means. And I come down the hill, like trying to act all enlightened and like spiritual and starts raining and everyone like scatters and they're like putting up their tarps. And like within like a half hour, people have got fires going and they're like under their tarps and I'm fucking, I have no fucking clue how to do any of this (laughs) shit. (laughs) I'm fucking, and they, they're like the the social worker or whatever, the guy, wilderness instructor, social worker guy, just like hands me an apple. He's like, doesn't say a word. <laughs> like hands me an apple. He's like, and the next day I'm like, all right, I got to figure out how to do this shit. And the, 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 the kind of culmination period on these things is you do like a three day solo where you sit basically in one space, you know, like maybe 10 feet around. And you don't move for three days. What do you have to make a piss? You got to go piss? <laughs> yeah. No, you go take a piss. <laughs> you, you know, you, but you, you, you know, you, maybe I'm exaggerating, 
that particular one is not 10, 10 by 10 or whatever. It's like a space. It's like an area. It's probably like the size of my office that I'm in right now. And, um, but you can, you make, you can make your fire, you can make your food and all that. And so I had these fat dreadlocks and like the sign, I think to my parents and everyone that I had like done chuva was like, did he shave his dreadlocks? Did he mm. shave his dreadlocks? So I didn't shave my dreadlocks on the first one. So now this one was coming to an end. I'll have to shave my fucking dreadlocks if I want to get out of the woods, basically. Wait, uh, what? Can you can you talk about that? Because, like, I mean, d- did that represent something to your parents in a different way than what it represented for you? Well, to everyone, it was like, you know, if you have the dreads, you're like a Rasta or a hippie and, like, you mm. smoke weed and it, like, makes you that. And, you know, in the end... Um, I think it was like a great move for me because my whole identity was, was, was that, you know, I was like, I had these dreads and it's like very much ego kind of thing. And it's great. It's your, you know, it's your identity and stuff. But that was my first like lesson in like shaving, right? Like the beard is the beard. was essentially the same concept for me. It's like when it becomes, it overtakes who you are and, um, and the feeling of just like, now I'm just normal. I'm just a regular person. And um, that was the feeling that I had. So that last solo, I mean, was one of like the greatest moments that I can remember of like contentment. It was pouring rain. And I knew the rain was coming. I'd already been out in the woods now for like two months. I was like, I could smell the rain in the air. And I, I gathered my wood quickly. The rain is coming and I get the fire going and I don't want the fire to go out from the rain. So I start adding more and I make this huge bonfire. And I take off my clothes. I'm dancing around this bonfire in the woods with my dreadlocks. And I cut my dreadlocks off. I think they had, I had a knife or they'd given me a scissor at some point, you know, when you're ready or whatever. And threw them in the fire and then had my, my uh, tent like perfect on the side of a hill. Like it was like in a cave almost and had my fire going and had made this delicious like lentils and rice with cheese that I had saved, you know, for three weeks and little pieces of meat. Like it was like, I'm like eating it and and it's raining all around me and I'm warm in warm clothes. And I'm just like, dude, this is it. This is the shit. This is, this is what you've, you know, been looking for, whatever. So it was, it was a very uh, powerful experience for me, you know, like anything I had, you know, a mixture ups and downs, like not everything's perfect, but there was some, some definitely, like I came out of that trip feeling empowered for sure. And that I could kind of like, that I could do pretty much do things, you know, for myself. My Elks Breakdown is supported by Ritual. Did you know that 95% of pregnant women are not getting their recommended daily intake of key omega-3s? Uh, enter Ritual. Their prenatal contains 350 milligrams of eco-friendly vegan omega-3 DHA in every serving sourced from algal oil instead of fish. Did you know that it's important to take a prenatal multi even before you're pregnant? The first 28 days of pregnancy are so important for a baby's neural development. There is no such thing as too soon to start. With supplements, less can be more. Many vitamin brands contain excess nutrients that our body doesn't even need. Rituals Essential for Women is research-stacked and science-backed. It's very easy, it's painless to incorporate Ritual products into my daily routine, and I love that they're vegan-friendly. Ritual's prenatal multivitamin is made traceable with vegan bioavailable and clinically studied key nutrients for before and during pregnancy, like omega-3 DHA to support baby's brain development and choline and methylated folate to support baby's neural tube development. Capsules have a delayed release design, it's gentle on an empty stomach, and there's a citrus essence to make taking your multis actually enjoyable. Rigorously tested and validated by a third party for allergens, microbes, and heavy metals, Ritual works with world-class certification bodies to validate their products. Ritual multivitamins are vegan, non-GMO project verified, gluten-free, major allergen-free, certified B Corp, and made traceable. Why settle for a multivitamin you're not 100% sure about? Ritual was literally built on trust, so you know it's the real deal. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash breakdown. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women Prenatal to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash breakdown for 25% off. My Alex Breakdown is supported by Thrive Cosmetics. 
If you've been here for any amount of time, you're probably pretty familiar with the diversity of my makeup routine. Most of the time, I'm out the door with a messy hair look, and I usually like to pair that with a nice lipstick and maybe a little bit of mascara, but I've also been known to show up with a full face when I'm feeling a little bit more glam every now and then. Whether you like fresh-faced, full glam, or somewhere in between, you've probably seen Thrive Cosmetics Viral Tubing Mascara. You know, the one in the turquoise tube all over your socials? Thrive Cosmetics beauty products are certified 100% vegan and cruelty-free, made with clean, skin loving ingredients, high performance and trademarked formulas, and uncompromising standards. It's easy to see why their bestsellers have thousands of five-star reviews. One of my favorite things about Thrive Cosmetics is they give back to a ton of causes that are personally important to me and so many of us. For every product purchased, Thrive Cosmetics donates products and funds to help communities thrive. They not only help me look good, but the causes they support make us all feel good. One of my favorite Thrive products is their Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara. It is so fancy. It lasts all day without clumping, smudging, or flaking, and gives you a lash extension look without damaging glue or salon prices. It's easy to remove and slides right off with warm water and a washcloth, no soap required. The nourishing ingredients found in Thrive's Liquid Lash Extensions Mascara support longer, stronger, and healthier looking lashes over time, and their flake-free tubing formula dramatically lengthens and defines your lashes from root to tip. Thrive Cosmetics is luxury beauty that gives back. Right now, you can get an exclusive 20% off your first order at thrivecosmetics.com slash MBB. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash MBB for 20% off your first order. When did you become religious? How long after that? A few years after, I would say. Was it, was, did, did you, was there a, a link? Like, did you see a link from that to taking on more religious observance? No, not at the time. Not at the time, but I did feel like a connection to being Jewish because there was like a, a feeling that I had, like, for example, when I came back and I was living in this little town, which is not so little anymore, Bend, Oregon. I don't know if you've ever been there. And um, there was a there was like a open mic coffee shop, open mic night that people would go. And I had met a kid in town, like a a, a ra- like a Rasta from town, you know, who played guitar. And we became really good friends. And um, we would go there, and like we would, people started coming to see us, so they gave us our own night. And so I remember, and I have video footage of this, like we drank mushroom tea. So this was the second year that I was there. <laughs> the first year I was sober, not the second year. Um, and like I wrapped myself in like all of these like blankets and like an Israeli flag. And then I had like sage burning and we would like walk through the audience, like blowing sage on everyone, like to the sound of cappuccino fucking machines. And like, (laughs) it's like this ridiculous. (laughs) Ah! And I get up on the stage of this little coffee shop and I just start asking who's Jewish. (laughs) (laughs) How'd that go over? Like as if I was like a Lubavitcher. So th- I had never even met a Lubavitcher before. I didn't know any of that. I'm like, who's Jewish? And there's like one like, <laughs> he's in the back, he's like raising his hand and this other girl. And I make them come to the stage <laughs> and hold the Israeli flag <laughs> <laughs> on stage like while I perform. And then we have this like random group of like some like 60 year old, like r- blind Rasta, <laughs> white Rasta from like who plays in his garage, like playing drums and like, like just the r- most random group of people up there. And then I'll just start singing like Hebrew prayers that I remember from, you know, Reconstructionist Hebrew school. And, uh, you know, that was like the early inception or the early, you know, version of Manus So I always kind of had this Jewish thing, but uh, yeah. I, I eventually I came back to to uh, New York. Got like again, like kind of like got sober or like stopped fucking around. Got a job at Borders. <laughs> <laughs> I started out in the coffee shop, and I moved to the music department. You know, which was a really big deal for me. And I would get these like matching outfits. I remember I would wear like this like red t shirt with like a vest over it, and it would match like my red kicks. And I would go to the gym and I would lift weights or, you know, I, would, I had a, my parents had a border collie that was like uncontrollable and I would take it out and like throw the Frisbee to it and run around in the woods with it. It was a nice sober time in my life. You know, 
I, and I, I saved money. I bought a little PA system and like a delay pedal. And I started messing around with like beatboxing and um, writing and singing and playing drums a little bit. And, uh, and I was like living at home. And then I went to college. I went to the new school, Eugene Lang College. It's kind of a cool place. Um, when did you sort of discover reggae music and sort of start resonating with that that specific kind of message? And also, you know, there's so much resonance with notions of Israel and Moses and sort of, you know, there, there's a lot of overlap kind of mystically and spiritually between, you know, um, a lot of reggae culture and, and, and Jewish culture. Was that a connection point for you or was it was it really the music? No, that was definitely a connection point for me. Even from going back to being 16 and being in Israel and just like, like you said, like all of the uh, imagery of the Old Testament and uh, the whole lineage of Solomon and King David and the Lion of Judah and like all of even like Bob Marley's songs, like, you know, are direct quotes from Tehillim, from the Psalms, you know, uh, stone that the builder refused will become the head cornerstone, not only just the themes, but Actually, it's that like old English, like biblical, you know, it's direct quotes from it. And, you know, when it was said in reggae music or by Bob or whatever, it was like, oh, yeah, like this is what this is what this means. <laughs> you know, this this is what it means. This is so reggae music. When I started listening to reggae music was like the a point for me where I was like, wait, they're definitely taking something from the Old Testament, from Judaism. That's something that I'm connected to in some way. And I need to like explore more what that is, you know, what it means. Did it ever occur to you that I mean, this? I'm 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 asking this because I know other people ask it. I don't have a problem with it. Did it ever occur to you? Like, was there ever a feeling of like, oh, white people shouldn't shouldn't make reggae music, or white people shouldn't be part of this, but Jews can? Like, how did that work for you? Um. Well, I don't kind of believe that when it comes to music. I kind of feel like. Music is like a different kind of thing and it like somehow speaks to people souls and people are able to create it. And you, you see that like with everything, right? You'll see like Elvis impersonators from Japan or you'll see who are like nail it, right? You'll, you'll see like all kinds of stuff, right? I mean, you see people doing things from one culture that have never been to the place where that, the culture that created that style, right? Why? Because music, because it's music. It like, it, it, it goes beyond. And if you have a hush and you are a person who knows music or have a talent, you're able to do it. And it's because it speaks to you in the deepest way. And that's why you can put it out there. Now, of course, there's like imitators and people who try. But for me, it was always like very much like it touched my soul. And that was how I kind of like regurgitated it. Now, what you're saying about the Jewish thing, yes, I am. I immediately said, like anyone who's going to come at me for this ha is ignorant. Because I actually have like partial ownership on this shit. Like they took our our thing, right? And made like dope ass music out of it and culture and all of that. Like we have shitty ass music. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and like, you know, that's how things work in our society, in our world. There's this intermingling of different things. And then like people come up with dope shit. And, it, and it, so, and then you have, you know, some kid from the suburbs listening to it and he's like, whoa, this is teaching me about my own culture. So I always had like a respect for it, but an understanding that it, or some aspect of it originates with, with my people. And that, for, that gives me license to it. And one time, like a very specific, uh, perfect example of this, I'm in like Amherst, Massachusetts. I'm up there for, there's a Chabad up there. We go up for Pesach or something. And um, there's some Lubavitchers that live up there. They're trying to start a community. Some, some of these guys become like my close, close friends. But at the time they take me out to a bar and one of the guys is like, you know, there's this like Rasta bar and it's all Rastas. It's not, it's, it's all Rastas from the Caribbean, from Jamaica or Trinidad or uh, Barbados or wherever. And uh, there's a band playing and I ask if I can get up and sing with them. And I get up and I perform like a thing. This is all kind of pre modest Yahoo. It's kind of like I, before Jimmy Kimmel. I don't think I have an album out or anything yet. And uh, most like 80% of the people in there are like, what the fuck? Their heads are blown. They're like, this is amazing. This Hasid like knows enough about our culture to be able to do the thing that we do and do it good. Right. 
And then this one chick is like flipping out, you know? She, what does he know about Haile Selassie and this, that, and the other thing? Finally, this old Rasta walks out with like a cane. Like I'm dreads down to the floor, white beard, you know? And he's like, sister, he's like, she's like, what does he know from Selassie? She's like, he knows from King David. <laughs> Right? That's a mic drop. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> and she shut up. Um, okay, so I really love I feel like of every of of every person we've ever had on this podcast, I think that you are the height of intersectionality and like cross phenomenal identities because I'm so glad that you've taken us on this journey because when when we get to this part of your life that then became, you know, sort of this hinge point for notoriety, it was attached to, you know, religious Judaism. Like, that's how a lot of people, like, some people didn't know anything about Jews <laughs> until they heard Matisyahu. I mean, even just like saying the words, like when I found out that there was someone with the name Matisyahu that was like marketed and that's his name, I was like, this has to be a phenomenal story. I assumed that you were raised religious. You know, I assume we call them FFBs. Um, but obviously your story, you've, you've, you've shared with us sort of what this journey is. I'm curious what the point was where you said, I'm going to take on a life that has prescriptions, that has time-bound commitments, that is connected to, you know, a very ancient kind of form. I mean, you know, there's several hundreds of years that Lubavitch, you know, kind of that sort of movement, um, which is really based on tremendous joy, singing, music, you know, Freilichkeit, like uh, happiness and that sort of celebration. But what was that moment or series of moments where you decided to sort of, you know, hitch your wagon to religious life? Um, okay, so I was in at the new school. I was in college. I started meeting mu a lot of musicians because the girl I lived with a girl named Sarah Bergman from LA, whose father was a cantor, uh, and she found me on like the second day of school after we had been there for a semester, and was like me and my Persian friend G from LA and our friend Olive need like a dude in the house, and so we want you. <laughs> <laughs> this is like at the orientation or whatever. So I ended up like moving into the living room of this apartment on 31st and Lex. And uh, she was dating the guitar player, John Lee, who was like the superstar guitar player at the new school. Everybody was sweating him really, really hard. And I started hanging out and trying to get on stage with all the musicians. So they were like having little gigs and stuff. And, um, and so I would do that and I would like perform from time to time, open mics or at some clubs. I was in school. I wasn't really happy in school. I didn't like, there were certain classes that were really important. And then other ones where I felt like really isolated and I just kept to myself. And again, I kind of came across this feeling of this loneliness in New York city, um, 20 years old or so. And I was working in the Bronx doing percussion with kids and I was living in Bushwick and the train ride from Bushwick to, to 160 to Yankee Stadium was like insane. So I would listen to music the whole time and I would write. And it was like a very like inward kind of time for me. I would I couldn't put a band together. And I, so I would go to like open mic nights where I would sign up on a raffle at like New York and Poets Cafe. And you might get called, you might not get called. You have to sit there like the entire night, listen to everybody else. Um, I was trying to figure out like how to do it, you know? And um, I kind of felt like hopeless, I guess. Like it wasn't, how is this gonna happen? Like I know I'm telling, I, at that point also, like, cause I didn't have a band, like in Oregon, I had a band and we were performing at clubs and colleges and stuff. And I was like 18 and it was like awesome. And now I'm in New York and there's no band. So I started going, getting um, just instrumental tapes of hip hop music on Canal Street. 
And it was like the Dr. Dre album had just come out. It was just like a beautiful time in hip hop, Lyricist Lounge and Most Deaf and Talib Kweli and just like really cool things happening. And um, and I would just, I was listening to early Sizzla and Capleton and Buju Bantan. It's like an era of dance hall music that like these artists did not put out great records for long periods of time. They put out a lot of records, but there was a specific time period where they put out gold. And it was right when I was like really listening and I would like absorb those records. And they're talking about Zion and they're talking about Jewish things. And, I, and it's rap music, but it's reggae music. It was like really, really hitting me hard. And then I was listening to like instrumental hip hop albums. And then I had this PA system I had bought from my working at Borders. And I would like, I would just like smoke weed in my living room with the doors open on 31st and Lex. And I would just blast this fucking music. And I would spit into the microphone, like, like into all these buildings into midtown Manhattan, like, and I would do that for hours and hours and hours. I would skip class and that's what I would do. Or I would go to work, you know, or I'd go to a class, whatever. And so that's really when I like craft, when my craft became real. Like that's when I really got good. And then at that point after that, whenever I would do what I did, people would be like, give this motherfucker, whoever signs this dude is gonna make money. Like people knew, like I would, op- I would do what I do. I would go to like the Lions Den, There'd be like a reggae band playing. I would be like, you guys, can you play No Woman, No Cry? Can I get up? They would be like, yeah. I would sing a verse of No Woman, No Cry, and then I would just spit like dance hall flames. And everyone there would would be like, what the fuck is that? And I would wherever I did it, I did it in Mount Vernon on 3rd Street, like in the projects um, for like an arts festival that I opened for Dougie Fresh. And, some, and it was the same thing. My friend, who's a sick-ass rapper, started rapping a white boy and they didn't get it. People started fucking booing and shit. And then I started singing some reggae thing and everyone just fucking flipped out, you know, thousands and thousands of like, you know, in the hood. Like, so it was like very obvious at that point that I, I knew that, that like I had something. And then I was like, but I don't know how to get it. I don't know how to, how to put it out there. Like, I don't, I don't even know, like a friend of mine got spotted in the street and he went to a casting and he ended up in a Levi's commercial. So I went to meet with this casting agent, Jennifer Vendetti, who now is like a big cheese. She's like the casting agent for Euphoria. But at the time, she was just finding people in the street. She put me in a couple commercials. And you're still not religious at this point? No, no, not religious. I went to Detroit and I did like a, the auto show in Detroit where I like sang for like a month. And like, I ended up, I remember like I had to fill in because I must have started getting a little bit into it. And I, I, ne- I remember I never put them on, but I brought them with me. And then I came back and then I got hit by a car. I had a motorcycle and I got hit by a car in the Bronx, a hit and run um, when I was leaving the school. Um, and then um, I started like feeling this feeling of like, I don't know. I know I'm supposed to do something really special and I have no fucking clue how I'm going to do it. And I started just praying. I started like going up. I was like, okay, I'm going to quit smoking weed, you know, whatever. And I'm going to like pray to God. And I would go up on the school roof of the new school and I would fucking put a talus on that my grandfather gave me and pull out a prayer book. And I would just start davening, like praying in Hebrew, even though I didn't know what the words meant. And, um, And like, eventually I was just started down this journey of like, I'm going to like really explore. Like I felt really alone. And I was like, I feel like the only thing that can, can like soothe me is somehow for some reason or whatever, I called it God, you know, it's like God will be the thing, you know, and that will, that's what will give me like the success. That's what will give me like like somehow God is going to do this for me and I'm going to like make a deal with him. I'm going to like, you know, it's like old school, like basic shit. Like I'm going to like not smoke weed and I'm going to be like really disciplined and I'm going to, I'm going to like serve him. Yeah. And then I, and then I, then I kind of like, then I went on my journey. I found Kalbach, Shul, and then I found Chabad. And then I eventually went to Yeshiva and did the whole, drank the whole juice and got like 
you know, there was a period of time where it's like very, like, this is a decision I have to make, you know, it's like either I'm, by, you don't just do it, you know, you might learn about it or like read books, but when you start like putting in the time, you're like, why am I doing this? This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make me happy. <laughs> so you're like, I either have to like make a decision, you know, either I believe this or I don't believe it. And that period of time where I'm sure you relate to this, Mayim, is like, it's like crushing. It's like you, when you're like, is this true? Is this not true? And in between stage. So at some point, you're like, you, not a lot of people can hang out in that in between space. And so you're just like, I was just like, fuck it. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it all. I'm going to be guided. I'm going to just destroy my ego. And um, if God wants me to do music and that's what I'm supposed to do, then he's going to know. Well, God is going to know that I'm serious about this shit. You know? so. I mean, talk about like Min like the like literally from the Narrows calling out. And what's fascinating is you already had this tremendous talent. And I mean, I, I, that is a place I wish I could have seen. Like, I wish I could have seen you in those early days because I can imagine this figure of you, you know, representing a, a force of music that people had not seen. They hadn't seen it in this way. They hadn't seen it the way you did it. So the fact that that then was brought through also, like through a religious path, meaning like everything just like, I mean, at least from my perspective, like everything clicked into place. And what's fascinating, and I think what's so powerful, especially for people like me who, you know, there's a lot of things about any religious practice, but in, in particular about Jewish practice and about Orthodox practice, there's a lot of that that's man-made. <laughs> it is. It's man-made. It's not woman-made. It's man-made. And there's a lot of it that creates a really, really important structure. And for people who fit in that structure, that's great. But the truth, like the MS of being connected to something bigger than yourself, of having a, a notion of salvation, that is what you communicated musically. And that, to me, is so incredibly powerful because no one, like I said, people who never heard of an Orthodox Jew were hearing this message. Like, it's in incredibly powerful. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what that expectation felt like, like what that, what that achare you felt, that responsibility felt like, because that has to be, I mean, people lost their minds when you shaved your beard. Like people lost their blessed minds because we had built up, you know, collectively we had built up who Matisyahu was, what he meant, what he had to mean. It had to be eternal. It had to be forever. I know you had to feel that. And you can shave your beard for whatever reason you want, but I am curious if that unfolding was because of the pressure. Yeah, I, listen, I got a little bit, uh, as they say in Philly, I got a little bit jaded. I got a little bit cynical. I had some experiences that showed me like some things that really were disturbing, bothered me, left me feeling even more alone. And, um, and then I had, I did my time. I did like 10 years deep, deep, deep into it. Like really, really going for it. You got married young, you had kids, like you did, you followed the formula. I Shiva for like two years. I didn't leave the basement of like, <laughs> seven, eight, whatever well, your, it was. Your skin got so pasty. You hadn't seen the sun in years. It was so hot. Literally, literally, there was a guy named Herschel Lazaroff. Okay, listen, early on, after I had become religious already, I go to yeshiva. I'm studying all day. No one knows that I do music or anything like that. And one guy comes to the yeshiva who had seen me like do something in Manhattan somewhere. And he's like, this fucking guy's here. And he's like, you have to do it for them. You have to do it for them. And like, it's, it's, we're in the Catskills because the whole yeshiva goes to the Catskills, right? So it's like Friday night, the rabbis are all there. It's Parshas Pinchas. It's like everyone is in a zealous mood. And like, <laughs> freaking, like, you know, if we all, it's the one time that we like get a chance to like really like let it out. Everyone's drinking Friday night and even the rabbis have their guards down, their families are there, everyone. And I get up on the fucking table and I do my shtick, like I do the thing. And like, they're all believers after that. 
the entire yeshiva and the most hardcore rabbis are like, oh, not this yo. <laughs> <laughs> the, the guy who like makes money for the yeshiva, this guy Yaakov, he's like, we're doing an alumni event. We'd love you to perform. <laughs> So it's all the old school Balchuvas from the 60s and 70s, right? The hippies that became Balchuvas during that era, right? They're just a real cast of characters. Um, Charlie Buttons is in the room, you know? It's like really like full on. I go to like in front of 770, there's like some Israeli guy, like homeless guy that plays the drums. And I'm like, come with me, come play the drums. I get a keyboard player and, it, and it, we all get there. Anyway, this guy, Herschel Lazaroff, sees me. He's a healer, right? He's a Baal Tshuva from Baltimore who gets paid like $20,000 to go to Switzerland and heal like God knows who or whatever, you know, maybe more than $20,000. I don't know what he got. But he freaking, he's like, my daughter is getting married tomorrow in Baltimore. I'll pay you $500 to come sing at the wedding. And I'll give you a free consultation. <laughs> so he come, comes to my my room in the yeshiva and he does this thing with a pendulum and i swear to god i feel like i'm tripping and he's like you are going to be famous you're going to make a lot of money here are the things you need to do you need one of these bulbs like that delivers sunlight stop I swear to God, that's how I that's how I got on this whole trip. Listen, he's like, when you study Gemara and Yeshiva, you need to have this sunlight thing because you get no sun. You need a bicycle and you need to ride it to Prospect Park every day. You need a therapist. I don't know who this guy is, but his name is Ephraim Rosenstein. Here's his phone number. And what? you need a voice and you need a voice teacher because you really don't know how to sing. <laughs> <laughs> right? I I did all of the things that he said. Wow. Yeah. And then when he got like really weird and he was like, you need to bring me to LA. There's all these wealthy people that need me. <laughs> I like had to get rid of him. You know, that's how these, these people are sometimes. But, uh, so anyway, yeah, I'm in Yeshiva and it's Tolucha, it's Rosh Hashanah. And I go out to, to walk with the shofar to blow shofar for Jews in Williamsburg. And I'm in Williamsburg and I run into Aaron Dugan, who's the guitar player I played with at the new school, who was like a close friend of mine. And um, anyway, I tell him, I want, you know, that there's an, another gig that came up. There's a guy in Chabad of NYU, Doviona Korn, who wants me to play a gig. Will you play with me? And we go and we play the show. And uh, there's some kind of like camera there. Like there's an, happens to be like a news thing there and somehow cnn sees that and steve harvey show sees that and jimmy kimmel sees the steve harvey show and then i have like a, a viral video on jimmy kimmel it's like all this crazy stuff kind of snowballing but to get back to like the main point where you asked is like the pressure the whole period of time i was super religious super religious like i would walk to my shows on shabbos like five miles people would be like honking their horns like modest i was on the freeway you know what I mean? Like walking to the gig. Um, I would stay at the Chabad houses. You know what did I mean? That feel, like, did it feel holy? At some point, uh, I felt like I knew what I was doing. Like, this is fucking badass. This is so punk rock. This is like, you know, I'm, I'm doing and then And then, like you said, it was, it was times where it was really difficult where I was playing four nights a week and I lost my voice. And now I'm supposed to have my night off, but I'm staying at the Chabad house. And they want, all of a sudden, they're like, a Chabad house that's never had more than 20 people there. And there's like 700 people and they're expecting a speech and a concert <laughs> with no instruments or microphones. <laughs> like that kind of thing would happen over and over again. And then I was living in Crown Heights. So everybody is like, oh, you know, has their opinion and asking, you know, for everything. And at some point I was just like, fuck everybody, you know, like really got pretty like, a little bit angry and people would see me all the time. They're like, why are you so fucking angry? <laughs> <laughs> like I remember on Pesach one time, like walking over a bridge, like walking to shul, there's no one around. And some kid, like 16 year old kid, like or modern Orthodox kid, like walking by and being like, Maris Yahoo. And then me just being like, oh, Hey, what's up? And then him just being like, what? Every time I see you, you're so fucking, you look so angry or upset or sad, you know? So I was, I was having a hard time. There's no question that I was struggling. Um, and um, 
In terms of the pressure, though, it's like, I didn't feel, I don't think I felt like uh, too much of a pressure because I always kind of had this little bit rebellious sort of side to myself, kind of like that I'm going to do my thing. And I, I had like one person who was really, really special for me. And he really helped me kind of like uh, feel like strength in what I was doing, you know, it helped also got like expand me, like let's learn also Breslov Hasidus. And then let's learn like some psychology. And then let's learn like some, like get some contacts for like where these Rebbe's were at what time, what was happening around them socially, what was happening politically, what was happening to the Jews, you know? And let's kind of like take all of this and break it down a little bit and take it like out of this like thing that like you don't question it, you know, just let's, let's really break it all apart. And in the process I found great songwriting lyrics and also like some real strength to like just do my thing and, you know this guy happened to be like a guy who was outlawed like he couldn't like he secretly was coming to crown heights um from hebron every month and he would see people in a basement you know abused people um balchuvas who who were lost like like myself, like all kinds of people. And uh, he like saved a lot of our lives. And like, no, a lot of people don't know about him. He's kind of like this very, he's not like the type of person like who would ever like put himself out there, you know? So he's missing like fingers because he was like lost all his fingers. They were like shot at him. Hebron, like point blank range. Like and he's like a Russian, you know, who like had to like sleep in like synagogues and like hide out from communists. And then he also, you know, was like a badass Israeli and like a super dope psychotherapist and then super humble. Like no one knows who he is under the radar. Now, he was kind of a big part of the reason why I stayed religious because he's religious. So he was kind of like my kind of like teacher. So, you know, he he was somehow a he was super rebellious. Intense, Jewish, religious and. I was like, if he's if he can do it, then 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 I can. But I remember speaking to him one time in Charleston, South Carolina. He would come visit me sometimes, like on tour, and we would do like meditations, and we would learn Kabbalah, and we'd like learn together. He like give me this inspiration, like it was awesome. And and that Shabbos, I remember, like we were like walking around Charleston. It was early. It was like maybe two thousand nine or ten or I don't know. And I remember being like, I have this like dream, you know of being free, of shaving my beard, of getting divorced, of like, you know, like I'm in a relationship with someone who, who I shouldn't be. There's like no two ways about it. Um, I'm my worst person when I'm around her, you know? And, and the religion is just like, I just like, I feel stuck in it. I don't, I don't feel like I really am moving in it. I don't feel like the same inspiration that I did. That was years before I shaved, you know? So this was like a long period of time that I really like, I, I didn't just like wake up one day and shave. It was like a long period of like unraveling not. And then it was like a one, then it was a one day. It was like a, it was like I woke up that morning and I was like, this is my face. I own this face. No one else does. If I want to shave, I can fucking shave. And I did. I went into I cried. I bawled my eyes out. This like Puerto Rican chick in super cuts is like shaving me. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, yep, I can do it. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about your connection to God? Because, you know, uh, I, I always say if people want to, you know, hate on religion, like hate on religion, don't hate on God. Like the, you know, God is still going to exist whether you you know, late fell in or don't, or, you know, keep kosher or don't. Um, what was your connection at that point? Did you still feel connected to that sort of larger entity or did it all feel like it was swallowed up by all of the prescriptions of religious Judaism? I really like tried to make it work for a while and like find my way within it and really dig hard. And Yom Kippur and Hebron are on a mountaintop, like you know, in Shem, like, um, you know, saying the whole book of Tehillim, like, 
you know, Shabbos Mavarchim, uh, walking to mikvahs, you know, miles away. Like, I mean, like really studying and learning and then figuring out how is it that I, that I take this, this information the best way. And I started doing these like walking meditations where I would chazer chassidus. I became like addicted to chassidus. I really like really got into it. And then I even had a teacher who was bringing in all kinds of other things to kind of like expand it. And davening, I really, davening for me is where it all started. I was like praying on the roof of that, that cot at the new school, you know. Prayer for me was always like a thing that felt real to me because I'm more of a heart person than a head person probably. So for me, it was always like, okay, you caught like calling out to God at that time. Like, how am I going to become Modest Yahoo? You know, I didn't know it was Modest Yahoo, but like, how am I going to become this thing that I want to be, you know? And like pray to God for it. Like not go like learn about Judaism or go learn about like learn a bunch of Gemara. It was like pray. So for me, prayer was like huge. So I I felt really that was the main place where I felt like closed up in Chabad. It was like the whole thing in Chabad is like bittel and like self nullification. So even the concept of like feelings and like feeling anything is like always sort of very cynical. Like if you're feeling it, you're feeling yourself. It's not really God. So the whole concept of prayer in Chabad is like very, very whacked out, even though it didn't start that way. Like the Alter Rebbe, they used to put him in a padded room because he would knock himself out when he died. He's the first Chabad Rebbe. So it became that way. And um, basically I started like riding my bike when I was, I was recording with David. Well, one Tishrei in Jerusalem, I was like walking my baby somewhere like on, on, on some Yom Tif. And I heard this like sound. I heard this like singing or screaming. I didn't know what it was. I followed it. It was a Carl Shul. And they scream. They scream at God, you know, at the top of their lungs. Like they know how to scream like, like, like heavy metal singers, you know, like they really like know what they're doing. And nothing is like, nothing is like a joint like song, but everything is in unison. Somehow they're all in the same key. And they're all in their separate melodies and it's chaos. And they're all having like their separate experience with God. And it's all very intense, like almost like a war, like they're fighting. And everyone is doing it together in a building at, at, at like 98%, like full fucking drive. So I was like, this is for me. And I, I started davening there. And then when I came back to New York, I, I started searching for shuls that were people daven like that. And I found these like amazing gem places like like these special places in new york you know like one of these places where i ended up there was like in williamsburg a mikvah with this old rabbit who passed away blue eyes white hair white beard just this and he would go to this mikvah and then he would go upstairs and i think his grandson would lead the davening and the grandson was like such a chassid he would be up from Tikon Chatzais, like it says David HaMelech used to wake up at midnight and play songs for Hashem all night long till six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. Then he would start his day. This guy would be up all night learning. And then by the time his grandfather came up to the shul, uh, it was this big, beautiful old shul, nothing like pretty, like nothing like fancy, but just beautiful. Uh, he would leave the davening and there would be barely a minion there. It'd be like, I oftentimes would make the minion and I'd clock out what time the Rebbe would like, would dip in the mikvah and I would show up right after him and I would go in the mikvah right after him. Then I would go upstairs and I would daven with these guys in the back because I didn't look like them and I didn't, but they, and that's where I like kind of learned how to daven in this place. Then I would ride my bicycle to Gansevoort Street in the meatpacking district and you sit with David Kahn for like eight hours, you know, like working on music and then ride my bicycle home at the end of the night at like, you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night from, from Manhattan to Crown Heights. And that was like my, I was like on a, you know, really on a, like a, a thing, you know, it was like a, that was like an avoda, you know, like a real like serious thing. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the religion, it just, at some point, I just felt like, I don't know what the, the main thing that kind of 
made me feel it wasn't real. Something about it made me feel that this it's man made. It's not. It's not really God. And then I started thinking, like, what? What? Like, who cares so much? Like, you know, like, like some. Not like some Nietzsche, like God is dead, but more like some, like, some, like, God is so pestered probably by all of us, like, you know, like people shooting in his name, Allah Akbar, right? And people doing, like, all kinds of, like, fucked up shit in his name. Like, God probably just, all he wants is to be left the fuck alone. (laughs) And I'm like, that's the biggest, most religious, like, service I could do to God is, like, stop, like, pretending that, like, I'm doing something for him or he's doing something for me and just leave him the fuck alone. Cause I don't know. So, but now, now, now with everything that's going on now is like, it's like something feels divine. Like there's, if you think about it, like the only way out of this is like some divine intervention. And when you, then you start thinking about the Jewish people and our history and you're like, there was divine intervention. There had to be. Whatever that looks like. I don't know what that means exactly. But, and so now I'm on some God shit again. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask because, um, you know, obviously your, you know, your music has been phenomenal, like really throughout. I mean, I think there's, there's so many different flavors to it, but there's still a real, you know, a real sense of, you know, an identity that, that understands something bigger than the human experience. Like, even if you're not singing, you know, uh, uh, things from Psalms and things from the Torah, like, there's still a, a, a really strong, you know, kind of spiritual pull that I feel, you know, with your music, even, um, you know, in this phase. Yeah, and I, I will say, like, not so long ago, I was taking a lot of psychedelics before concerts. Like, not microing. It was pre microing before anyone knew anything about microing. To me, it was microing. It was like one hit of acid. It's like a micro, not two hits of acid. <laughs> and I started doing things like going to my therapist, going to my voice lesson, going to the recording studio, like on a hit of acid. And then like going to play shows, you know? And um, it was like super, everything was tied up with God for me at that point. You know, and that was like 2014, 2013, 2015, around that time. So it's not like I just like, like, it wasn't like I became irreligious and then just kind of like stopped thinking about God. I actually went the opposite way. I became like more and more like everything is about God. And like now that I don't have these rules and everything and I'm free, like I can like, (laughs) I can go like all the way with this. And I felt like I really, really like climbed up the mountain and I put out this album called Ikeda. And then, um, and then on the other side of that mountain, I didn't know how to like, how to, how to, uh, take it all in. So I kind of like rolled down the mountain (laughs) on the other side, you know what I'm saying? So, and then where I ended up is in a place where I felt that way, you know? So it wasn't just like, I didn't go straight from religion to that. You know? Well, and also that was, you know, that was almost 10 years ago now, right? Like your your path has has led you so many other places. You, you know, you've become a father again several times. You know, you have um, a new identity in that sense as also like this age of dad, because also, you know, having kids young is like you're a child yourself. I mean, I still feel like I'm a child. (laughs) Can you tell us about your new album? Uh, It's called Hold the Fire. It's an EP with five songs on it, but I recorded 40 songs. I'm going to be releasing them all. You recorded 40 songs? What? Jonathan, we now have our Spotify playlist for 2024. (laughs) I recorded 40 songs last year between like maybe February and August. What's yeah. that like? How do you record 40 songs? That's amazing. Well, the song, the whole album is called Hold the Fire, which is based on a dream that I had, which is a real dream that I had. I was, and I remembered it. I don't know how, but um, I woke up. I mean, I was, I was dreaming. I was in a synagogue and, and I, I say Morocco, but I have no idea. Some Sephardic synagogue somewhere in the Middle East where Jews used to exist. 
that don't exist anymore because we were forced out and pushed out. But in the old days, there were Jews that, you know, lived with Arabs and there were different religions and there was Muslim, there was Jews, you know, they lived together. I was in a synagogue and I was davening and then I was playing with this like baby tiger. And then the, the mom started shooting fire out of her eyes and I was like engulfed in flames and I was like on fire. And then I like all of a sudden realize I'm like not feeling any pain and I'm not burning. And I look at my hand and my hand is made out of water. <clears throat> so then like when I woke up, I think of like the burning bush immediately and Moshe. Moshe is drawn from the water. He's a, he's a humble person. He is, uh, he's like the element of water, Moshe, right? Even the Moshe, it sounds like water. It's like smooth. So um, for me, this is like idea of the burning bush, which I remember learning a concept that like, what is a fire that doesn't consume itself? And I thought of like all the artists and even myself as I was in my 30s of like this fire, like pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing. And at some point you can either like burn, burn out, like, you know, you go up in flames or you kind of like take the other, the other route and you just kind of like mellow out and just become um, kind of like drown. And so to me, the idea is like, of like moving forward as an artist, as in your forties and moving even to your fifties, maybe sixties is like, hold the fire. How do you hold the fire? You know, you have to have this combination aspect of Moshe and also, you know, the fire. So how do you do that? And so like, even now when I'm singing songs like live like a warrior or Lord raise me up, I'm like all these metaphors, these physical metaphors that were about spiritual things that came from this like very Jewish place inside me, they like resonate a hundred percent. So it's kind of like a trippy thing for me. That's so, it's so awesome. And, you know, I have to say, like, I don't, I hope this isn't, it doesn't make you uncomfortable. The way that, that I feel about your most kind of deeply spiritually motivated music, it's the way that I feel when I learn Torah that feels timeless. And I'm not saying that you are, I mean, I believe we are all, you know, divine expressions and you, you happen to have a particularly exceptional instrument with which to sing, um, and sing God's praises. But the, the notion, and I think that's what is already so powerful about the songs that I've been able to hear from this new album. Um, when you're singing about the elements, you know, when you're singing about the way that you do about fire, you know, and about water and about all these, like, those are, those are eternal concepts. And that's how I feel like my, my favorite song is Time of Your Song. Like it feels like Torah to me because it's all of those themes kind of infused. Um, and I just, w we've been so impressed already with what we've gotten to hear and I hope everybody will check it out. Um, also, you're touring with this album, correct? Yeah, I'm playing 34 cities. What's the gematria of 34? I know 32 is Lev. I don't know. Heart. 32 is hard. I don't know what 34 is, but I'll find I'm it. Playing 34 cities. Um, and yeah. Oh. What's oh. 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 <laughs> oh. You want to know? <laughs> I don't know. What is it? I think you do. To flow in waves. 34? 34. To flow in mean? waves. Aleph Gimel Ahmed. I mean, other things also, but that is one of them. Aleph Gimel Ahmed, to roll mm -hmm. like water, to flow in waves, to well like the wellings and reservoirs of dew. It's pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love Judaism. Same. Right? Same. This is, that's, the, that's what I love about it, that part. Yeah, you know, it's another dimension to everything. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot of dimensions to you, Matis Yahu. It has been such a pleasure to get to sit and hear your Torah, as it were. Where can people find out all things Matis Yahu? Matis Yahu uh, on Instagram, <laughs> I think. Awesome. Uh, 
And also, we wish you only good things. Um, I knew your kids, your oldest, when they were little. They are now grown. Your older one also is a musician. This blew my mind. You play together. What is that like? Um, I just saw Levy when I was in Israel. He performed in Tel Aviv at some kind of like uh, breaking artists thing with like five other artists. And he crushed it. I bawled <laughs> the whole time. I was like trying to keep it inside because his last he did one in, at SOBs in New York and I kind of helped him with it, you know, like get ready for it. And he put a lot of energy into it. And then the sound guy was out to lunch and he like left the building. He was like outside smoking a cigarette and I like lost it. <laughs> I, I lost it. And for 45 minutes, I like, I did like the dad thing and I was like, I like ranted and then I like with a microphone on stage and then I like I like adjusted like volume knobs until it was and so at this show it was very special for me because I was just like I'm not gonna do that ever again later. <laughs> <laughs> let me just sit in the back and then I just sat in the back and fucking cried the whole time like we did like a 35 minute set where he sang every note talk to the audience authentically, own the stage, had a great band, like all of the things that I was just like, ha like he had his boys there singing the choruses to every song. So it felt like it's a hit, you know? <laughs> I was just like, I was like, it's this very special moment in my life. Yeah. I mean, like you think as a parent, like, oh, if my kid like wins a Grammy or if he does this, I was like, I'm done. I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> This is all I needed. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you have, and you have, you have other little ones. So we uh, we're very eager to see what they do. Yeah, how old are your youngers? Also, his younger brother Dove Bear. Uh huh. Don't sleep on him. Because <laughs> he just he's releasing his first song on the thirty first and coming on tour with me. Oh my gosh! Wow. <laughs> He'll be performing every night, and he is a badass. Wow. Kid, he's so dope. So I'm I'm really looking forward to sharing him with the world as well. And how old are your little ones? And then I have Menachem, who's they they tried to put him in movies, you know, but my ex wife, you know, she didn't go for it. They wanted him to be in like multiple movies. Like this kid is like also like super special kid. And then um, but he's just you know going to school, Chabad, and a fly, and uh just be like having his bar mitzvah soon and just like he's like he's the, he's the one though i wanted to name him freedom but he was born on the rebbe's birthday so i, I had to name him Menachem Mendel. born on the rebbe's birthday so it's like no question and then i have my daughter sasha she's nine she's in bend oregon where i used to live remember that. and she's a super special girl. she's a fighter correct yeah, she had heart, heart issues and heart surgeries. And she's like the dopest chick ever. <laughs> like, super punk rock, like badass. She don't, yeah, she's dope. And then there's uh, then my, there's my babies, you know. Esty River. And, and Judah, Judah Mac. Mac. <laughs> Judah Mac Miller. Judah Mac Miller, let's go. Yeah. That's awesome. I was wondering if we'd get a, a Maccabee themed name since you are Matis Yahoo. So I guess it took a minute. <laughs> Yeah, the last number six. Number, <laughs> I, I think that's the last. Okay. Well, we'll be standing by just in case. Um, really, thank you so much. We wish you only good things um, with Hold the Fire, with touring, and and just on a personal note, thank you so much for everything you've given to our community through every phase of your career. So thank you. What you didn't hear as he was uh, signing off and repeating working with Valerie to get his audio uh, footage to her or his audio recording was that he says, I love talking to her. I want her to be my therapist. <laughs> um, he's done a lot of interviews. I've read a lot of interviews, but I have to say, I think this was my favorite Matis Yahoo interview. He said something like this was one of his favorite interviews. Yeah, it was really, really special to get to talk to him. You know, I, I wasn't sure how open he'd be to um, 
you know, to being asked pointed questions about things that were very controversial. And um, there's a tremendous amount of, of pressure on him. And, um, you know, I know because I was, you know, part of that community who watched him come up and we were so proud of him for for being so open about his love of God and his love for, um, you know, traditional Judaism. I thought he really threaded that needle so, so nicely um, to kind of talk about what worked for him, what didn't work for him, and how that doesn't have to mean that that's the end of your relationship with God. If you shift your observance, um, in many ways it can mean the end of a certain portion of your life and your community. Um, but I, I think he, you know, he did a, a really good job uh, walking us through sort of what that journey has been like. He reminds me a lot of, you know, the guys that I grew up with in Toronto who were musicians. Um, he has a far more intense relationship to religion and to spirituality than I think a lot of them did, or at least that they expressed to me. But I just interesting that the New York guy of that age and the Toronto guy of that age and that generation exploring that type of music, trying to find their way as musicians, uh, has so much overlap. I'm curious if any of our Toronto listeners, I know we have some, <laughs> recognize his story and their friends who went on tour. So fascinating. And and also just that image. I mean, he's so expressive. He's so... Um you know, he, he's so articulate in the way that musicians can be, you know, he's such a lyricist, even just how he speaks and just that image of him, how he was describing, like cutting his dreadlocks off and burning them in the fire. I mean, it's so, I mean, he's got something with fire. It keeps coming back. When he was talking about owning his face and when the beard becomes, you know, more than the personality, you know, it becomes a thing outside of himself. I'm like, do I have to cut my beard off? Has, has it gone too, <laughs> too long? I thought that was really interesting, you know, because when, when you think about not only religious observance or people who are, you know, tied to a religious life, um, but even when you think about fashion and how people dress and, and what people want to appear like and what kind of clothes we wear and what trends we take on so that we look like that punk rock kid or we look like that kid. You know, I, I wonder, like, there's something to religious life where there are essentially uniforms that removes a lot of those gestures. I mean, that's one of the reasons that in religious communities, men and women in Judaism have kind of uniforms that they wear. There's often restrictions on the colors that you wear and the styles that you wear. And the notion is not just like, oh, let's live like it's the 1800s, which for some people that might be the appeal. But I thought that was really interesting that he said that because there is this notion of like how much of what we present is ego. How much of what we show is what we want other people to think of us or we want them to think like, oh, she's that person who wears Doc Martens, right? Or he's that person who shaved his head. You know, how much of what we do is bound up in that? And when you meet people who, as, in, as an intention, are pretty kind of plain wrap, you kind of see that when you strip that away, what's left is who actually is that person? What do they stand for? What do they care about? What do they speak for? There's something actually about, though, that uniform that also has an identity to it, that if you're wearing that clothing, limited in that way, you're now actually excluded from mainstream society, and you're only associated with that other culture. So in, in a way that like, oh, I'm not going to have ego because I'm not going to wear the Doc Martens or I'm not going to wear the Nikes and I'm only going to wear these uh, plain clothing actually has the opposite effect is what <laughs> I heard him say is like, oh, I don't only want to be this person who is religious or highly observant and that separates me. I mean, I have a little tiny, tiny bit of this. Like I put on, I bought a lot of great t-shirts so I don't have to make any decisions and I just wear great t-shirts. Um, it's not the same, but I think there is, you know, in his adoption of um, religious, the religious outfit and the accessories that go with that, I, I heard him say that he was sort of losing his identity in that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that touches on, you know, some of the most basic questions we have about sort of 
who we are, what do we represent ourselves as? You know, I, I often sort of, you know, let myself fantasize about like, what was it like to live 10,000 years ago? You know, when there weren't so many choices. There wasn't so much about, you know, I don't know, what kind of phone do you have? What are you wearing? What do you look like? I mean, there was a lot of other problems, like how not to get eaten by wild <laughs> animals, how to give birth without being killed in the forest. But, you know. I mean, you taking yourself with exactly who you are right now, putting yourself 10,000 years ago, <laughs> what would be in your head to replace all the song lyrics that you have now? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Would it be quiet in there? I think you would know all the bird song. You would like be able <laughs> yes. to mimic every type of bird that has ever crossed your path instead of every song lyric that ever crossed your path. Also, what did you think about this whole idea of um, leaving God alone? Because there's he has an excerpt in one of his interviews that he talks about how singing is, you know, praising God. And that, you know, what I loved was this idea that God has done all this hard work and sometimes the world is in this chaos and has is all messed up and he's like telling god that god has done a great job but then in this you know he was talking about sort of leaving god alone as the greatest thing you could do so the quote that you're talking about he said um with my music the words come together and i feel like i'm telling god something about himself I feel like he needs to be told he's good. Imagine if you created something that became so messed up, you'd feel crushed because you hoped it would be only good. I feel as though God needs to be reminded that he did something great. I have this idea that God's trying to learn more about himself through this world and through us. So there is a, um, you know, there's a, there's a tradition that goes back centuries and centuries that, you know, the creation of this universe was, you know, kind of the way that something bigger than us was trying to have a relationship with us and that we are in, you know, a loving partnership. And that's sort of where a lot of that imagery of like God as a parent or God as a father or a mother, um, that, you know, we're in partnership, almost like we're, you know, children of this. And when you see the things that because of free will, humans do, <laughs> um, it can it can feel like a rift in that relationship. And so there is this sort of mystical notion that that's what good deeds are. That's what, when you hear people talk about mitzvot, that that's what good deeds are. There are ways that we try and like add some of that light back to a world that that often has a lot of darkness. So I think that is sort of that idea of what he said, is that that notion of leaving God alone is, you know, um, we try and do so many things to repair, but, you know, in the world of of humanity and darkness, there's a lot that's hard to repair. And so there is a notion of, um, I think, that he was indicating of kind of like, stop trying so hard to show how good we are or just stop trying so hard to, to prove that we can make up for something. Um, a, a lot is done in the name of God on every side of every conflict. You know, wars are fought in the name of God. And um, that's not, you know, I don't think what God intended. I, I am going to um, quote from my favorite Matzis Yahoo song because it touches on a lot of the things that we talked about, the world is moving to the song I hear. Who's that singing? Wind is rushing in my ear. Mind gushing memories, almost lost everything. Felony and fellows running in my dream. We were in the van where the hits were driving. Saw myself in the highlands at age 13. And I'm asking questions to the present day me, moving backwards down the hill. See, we were posting. Moonlight, illuminate my night, and my day's sunray make the people say, and a vision, something's missing, so they're screaming out loud, keep my feet on the ground and my head in the clouds. I'm the arrow, you're my bow, shoot me forth and I will go, and I know and I go, and I go get up and go, make me feel it's for real, tell me what you know. Love it. Oh, I love it. I love it, love it, love it. And I always thought he was singing about his journey. And after today, I'm pretty certain. Uh, keep your feet on the ground and your head in the clouds from our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one and now she's going to break down. 